Hello and welcome to another National Academic Integrity Network podcast hosted by QQI. My name is Ashling Reist and as well as being the Head of Quality Enhancement at the RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences, I'm privileged to sit on the National Academic Integrity Network Steering Committee. The National Academic Integrity Network, or NAIN, is a peer-driven network focused on actively supporting higher education institutions to effectively engage with the challenges presented by academic misconduct. For today's NAIN podcast, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Michael Draper, Deputy Pro-Vice-Chancellor of Education at Swansea University. Michael is a professor in legal education. He is also a consultant expert with the UK Quality Assurance Agency and the Council of Europe ETINED platform. He has published extensively in the field of academic integrity. He is currently in Ireland to attend QQI's 10th anniversary conference, which also happens to be taking place during National Academic Integrity Week. Michael, welcome to the podcast and welcome to Ireland. Many thanks. And it's a joy to be here again, I have to say, working with the QQI. Thanks, Michael. So let's think about the conference that's coming up this week. And, and one of the panel discussions you're participating in is titled Combating the Global Threat to Academic Integrity, What Can Be Done? So for listeners who may be less familiar with the global challenges, can you describe why there is now considered to be a global threat to academic integrity? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. The Etinad platform of the Council of Europe have just passed a recommendation uh, in July to member states, which of course Ireland and the UK are signed up as member states. And as part of that recommendation education fraud, um, there is a, a requirement to address the fact that co commercial contract cheating operates across boundaries. It is no respecter of member states, that's for sure. And we need to address that cross-boundary, cross-border nature of commercial contract cheating with collaborative exercises between uh, individual countries and regulators of those countries, sharing knowledge, uh, sharing expertise, so that we, one, we don't reinvent the wheel, and two, we can stay a step ahead, if that's possible, for those providing these commercial contract cheating services. So nation states can actually um, ensure that their legislation, their frameworks, their policies, their regulations address commercial contract cheating, but they operate outside of our boundaries normally. So we need yeah. to have collaboration to address that. And it's great to see that there's so much increasing international collaboration in this space. So uh, I suppose over recent years, we've had the ENAI and the ICAI, and now we're looking at these networks, obviously the work of ETINED, but also the launch of the Global Academic Integrity Network at, at the conference later this week. Um, and I suppose, why do you think there's there's such a need for this kind of continued working together? I suppose we, we know that there is that there's a that, that that boundary thing doesn't apply. But what what can we do by working together? What's the advantage of, of actually getting together and, and sharing that knowledge? Well, um, it's a resource issue. If every single institution did this themselves, the time and resource to do that would be significant and we have limited budgets. But if we club that budget together or we share those resources, we actually become far more effective in terms of the action we can take. We're not reinventing the wheel, as I said, so that we can share that knowledge around addressing these issues. And uh, it also means that we can move to protect the reputation, not only of our institutions, but also of our nation states in terms of a destination for international students to come and study. So it's, it's much broader than simply protecting your institutional reputation which is important clearly, but also about protecting the, the reputation of a particular nation destination for international students. And particularly those, for example, in China, where they look at league tables of where, not just an institution, but where country ranks in terms of standing internationally for education purposes, this is particularly important. That's so interesting. And, and I suppose one of the things there you've touched upon again is, is you know, that, that, that global nature of the issue. and and. That is, is, as I suppose, you know, a, a very important approach. But there's also approaches obviously been taken at national level. So if we look particularly at law and as a professor of legal education, you've obviously got particular insight into this and and, and how law can potentially be used to combat, combat issues in, the, in this area. So as you know, in Ireland since 2019, we've had a statutory basis for the prosecution of those who facilitate 
cheating by learners, who advertise cheating services and who publish advertisements for cheating services. And the UK has obviously brought in legislation as well very recently that's tackling, tackling the issue from a slightly different angle. But I suppose given that it's a global issue and, you know, we, we are dealing with uh, operators that are outside of a lot of even the EU states, do you think these laws have a value and, and can they play a part? Uh, I think the value is, is around advertising. We, we know that um, students are bombarded on a daily basis through TikTok and other social media platforms. You know, users using services are very, very blatant. Now, most of the established social media platforms uh, will have a policy which basically states we will not support criminal activity. So if you've actually managed in your nation state to make activity criminal, it's a criminal offence. You can then go to that social media platform and say, look, this is a criminal offence, it's happening on your platform, take it down. Now, I think that is particularly important. But we also ought to need to remember is that it changes the conversation we have with our students as well. It's not just a moral anymore, not just a matter of uh, I might be kicked out of university. But most students will have a social conscience. The criminal activity behind SA mills and commercial contract cheating services has an impact globally on the way people live, on the exploitation of sub-Saharan Africans, etc. I don't think students appreciate that most of the work done is actually contracted out at piecemeal rates. People surviving just by producing this work, they don't seem to have an alternative. So there's a bigger social conscience piece, I think, around this as well, that this is leading to exploitation of individuals in other countries. That, that's so interesting because I think, you know, when we first started having the conversation about academic misconduct uh, in Ireland a few years ago, when we were establishing the, that that word of victimless crime was was being touted about. And, and you know, when you talk about, I suppose, that that level of exploitation, it's, it's clearly not a victimless crime. And then if you look at what's happening with our students, you know, there, there's victims on, on that end, too. And and I think that you, you, you wrote an article with with Thomas Lancaster, Sandy Dunn and, and Robin Crockett, where you set out that contract cheaters are now embedded within many institutions using sharp practices to connect with vulnerable customers, but also perfectly placed to blackmail students or threaten to report them to their institution. So, I mean, we, we are talking about, you know, uh, victims within our institutions as well. And, and do you think there's enough awareness of, of these kinds of issues, either among students or staff within higher education institutions? Uh, no to both. Uh, students, for example, are very used to making purchases over, over the net, give their financial details out. They don't realise those details will be sold on or they're going to be blackmailed. And it happens. I've seen it firsthand. The students come to me and I've said, look, you've got to go to your bank. You've got to change all your financial information because your information is now being sold on the dark web. You'll be, wow. um, and if you hadn't come to see me, you would have been exploited, not just now, but later on in your employment as well. They don't stop. This is blackmail. And it's significant. So it's not it's so it's not a victimless crime because yes, the student may end up as a victim or long term. People producing this work for these organizations are also exploited. So it's important that I think people put this into a societal context as well. It's not just that this is not a higher education problem, mm. this is a society problem about how we organize ourselves. The students go out to be doctors, nurses, architects, pilots. We want to make sure they've been one properly trained, but two have earned the qualifications that basically are the badge of their ability to carry out one particular task. I don't want uh, you know, a nurse treating me who's basically gained that qualification because they bought all of their assignments. And, and that can be said of any profession, any, any profession that faces with, this, uh, with, with the public. So, so it, it, it is, as you said, a, a much wider issue than, than maybe just what's going on in, in higher education. So do you think at national level there, there needs to be something done uh, or, or maybe, you know, uh, so either by states or maybe just by institutions in order to kind of resource and professionalise the response to this? Because I suppose it sounds like we're dealing with, although dubious, increasingly professional, dare I say it, organisations in terms of how they go about their work. Um, so to counter that, do, do we need to do something to, to, to resource and professionalise how we as a respond, either as an institution or at state level? Yeah, I mean, clearly we've got to properly resource student support skills, development of backing integrity skills, etc. That's important. We've got to resource staff training in terms of detection and follow that through, give type, proper time allowances, um, etc. 
Because if we don't do that, then staff are going to say, oh, I haven't got time to do all this. And then what happens? Well, what we're looking at at the end of the day is the value and the quality of the award of the institution. Does that matter to you or does it not? Now, it matters if you get a reputation for a particular being a particular type of institution. You may not get those good quality students coming to you that you want to attract in because the value of your award is devalued. So we need to invest in staff training. We need to invest in, in, in student training. Uh, this is absolutely vital and we need to resource it properly. And, and I think, you know, you've, you've touched on, I suppose, some of the key actors there, the staff, the students and so on. And, and, and the need for that kind of whole community approach. And I know you've spoken about, about that before, but maybe just to focus a little bit more on the students in, in terms of, I suppose, you talk about academic supports there, there for students. Um, but I've heard you speak previously about, you know, making sure the students have timely information, making sure that they're mentored appropriately. And you also spoke about that triad, which I, I'm fascinated by, of, of opportunity, pressure and rationalisation that, yeah. that can lead students to engage in academic misconduct. So what do you think as, as higher education institutions we need to be doing to support our students um, uh, and really, I suppose, keep keep those pressures off um, so that actually that they're, they're as, as well supported to engage with their work with integrity as possible? We need to induct students into each level of education. So they may come in at level one, but we need to have an induction to level two and level three of the undergraduate programme. We can't just see this as something you do at the beginning of your undergraduate studies. It then has to be timely, so around assessment time, that is reinforced. We give proper feedback through personal tutoring and academic mentoring uh, to students. But I've also seen a change of mindset in students as well, with assessments being more remotely oriented. COVID obviously um, yes. and more remote assessments. But I've seen research done of students who basically are saying, well, institutions must know we're going to cheat because otherwise they don't care. They're not invigilating the exams, they're letting us take it away and do it. So they must expect this. Now that's interesting that we're not dealing here with just inadvertent plagiarism uh, or, or, or blatant commissioning. Well, they must expect us to collude. You know, why are they allowing us to do this? So that mindset or attitude of students is, has changed uh, since I've been working in this field. And we have to address that centre on. But just because we give an assessment, which has got a 48 hour, 24 hour window, we expect it to be your own work, in your own words, properly referenced. And that needs to be made clear to students what is required in terms of proper referencing, proper attribution, etc. That remote exams aren't just an excuse to go and talk to your friend about it and do it together. And, th and that's interesting. So that's the change that you've seen, particularly in the last couple of years, kind of exactly. the, the COVID and post-COVID period. Yeah, exactly. And, and and it is interesting because it probably feeds a little bit of everybody else's doing it. So maybe if I don't do it now, I'm at a disadvantage as opposed to thinking that it's the exception to engage in this kind of activity. Yeah, we don't realise what students see. They see each other. They know they've been bombarded by these, these algorithms. They, are, they know that some students are taking advantage of it and they see the institution doing nothing. Now, how does that make students feel or a student who actually does that hard work, the hard graft? puts their own work in, but then sees that those that's cheating to actually get a higher mark, a higher grade with them. It doesn't make for a healthy environment. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose it, it brings us back to this, uh, I suppose, reality that a, that a multifaceted approach needs to be taken. So you, you start with your laws and your, your international collaboration, but you also have to support your students and support your staff as much as possible to, to a create an environment and a culture where academic integrity is fostered. Well, also, I think you look at consumer legislation. If you say you're going to provide students with a certain level of education support, are you actually doing that? Because you can't set students up to fail. And if we're actually asking them to actually self-learn academic integrity skills, we are setting students up to fail. And I think from a lawyer's point of view, if I was driving a coach and horses through all of this, looking at what institutions are doing, I just see this as an opportunity you know, to act for students. I'm sorry, we're getting on for 25 past and I have to test. No problem. So what we'll do, we'll ask one more question, if that's OK. Before we finish up, change is challenging. And as we said, resources are tight. So if there was one single change or step you would recommend that members of the academic community in Ireland take, what would it be? Uh, I would look at everything turns around assessments. So look at how you assess 
look at the feedback you're giving to students. Assessment is the crux of all of this. If assessments are designed in a certain way, if students get the right feedback, co-creation of assessments, then you go some way to addressing this. Do we go back to e-proctoring or proctoring or, or visualization of exams? You know, some people advocate for that. Others say we need to keep flexibility, but we need to make sure how we design assessments so they're cheap proof. Brilliant. Exactly. Michael, thank you. That has been a really fascinating conversation and, and thank you for sharing your time and expertise. And thanks too to colleagues in QQI and the National Academic Integrity Network for organising all of these week's events. If you'd like to learn more about the National Academic Integrity Network, we've a dedicated space on the QQI website, which is qqi.ie, where you can learn more about our events, download our resources like the National Lexicon and Guidelines. And we also have a framework for academic misconduct coming up soon, uh, soon to be published. So thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, my name is Ashling Reese, and I've been privileged to have been in conversation with Michael Draper today. Thanks, Michael. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.